Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host. Thanks so much for joining in. So, some people have written me through my website slash blog, bloomingwellness.com. Go there if you haven't yet. Um, and asked me to do an episode on ketamine. Now, some of you might have only heard about ketamine as like a street drug or cat valium or whatever. You know, that war on drugs lingo. <clears throat> But in recent years, there has been a lot of interest in studying its use for things like depression, anxiety, and PTS, or post-traumatic stress. In fact, there is a growing interest in the therapeutic benefits of many psychedelic drugs for mental health troubles. A few episodes back, I interviewed Dr. Dave Smith on the history and future of psychedelic medicine. He was one of the original founders of the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinics, and he provides a great overview of how politics and the public's perception and morality and misuse to some degree derailed legitimate research on these drugs when it comes to treatment and therapeutic benefits. And you know, of course, there are a lot of anecdotes out there. And I have to say, most of the personal stories I've heard about people using psychedelics for depression or PTS have been positive. So I'm really curious to see what the growing body of research in this area shows. So in this episode, I'll be chatting with Jack Swain, head of clinical operations at MindBloom, and one of the authors of a recent paper published in the Journal of Affective Disorders in October of this year, 2022, titled At Home Sublingual Ketamine Telehealth is a Safe and Effective Treatment for Moderate to Severe Anxiety and Depression findings from a large perspective open label effectiveness trial. From their website, MindBloom is a mental health and well-being company set on increasing access to effective science-backed treatments for anxiety and depression, and they are starting with guided ketamine therapy. Uh, they do partner with licensed doctors and clinicians to accomplish this. So in the podcast, Jack will tell us more about MindBloom and how they do what they do, the theory behind why ketamine helps with anxiety and depression, particularly its dissociative effect. I also ask him a lot of details about the study, so he'll break down the method section for us, how they set it up, what they use to measure improvements in depression and anxiety. He'll talk side effects, results, safety, how they set up the study so you could do this at home, and the benefits of sublingual or under the tongue therapy versus getting ketamine through like an IV. Uh, and of course, any upcoming research they're working on. So give me a few seconds here, guys. This is cool and timely stuff. And let's connect to Jack. All right, guys, we are connecting to Jack Swain from Mind Bloom. Thank you so much, Jack, for being here on Causes or Cures. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So Let's start out. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and MindBloom, what you guys do? Yeah, sure. So a quick background on me. I started my career in technology consulting and then went to business school where I was really interested in healthcare and joined a healthcare consulting company called The Chartist Group. And well, I had no idea like a company like this existed where I could like, go into consulting, but also do something that was really good for society. Um, and so loved my time there. I led strategy and operations projects for big health systems like Michigan Medicine and Cleveland Clinic, um, working in like value-based care and mergers and acquisitions, like innovative, um, like payer uh, provider partnerships. And then was serendipitously contacted by a lifelong friend, Dylan Bynan, who's the CEO of MindBloom, who was launching this new venture and looking for a healthcare consultant um, to help launch the practice and, and work with our medical director. And so I'd seen, so my, Mind Bloom is a mental health company that provides at home ketamine therapy for anxiety and depression. And at launch, it was in person and at home ketamine therapy, everything started in person. Um, but so this was like kind of a, a, a dream offer. I've been drawn to the mental health space for personal reasons. Like my family has been really impacted by depression and alcohol addiction. And I've seen firsthand how 12 step programs and antidepressants and talk therapy just don't get so many people the results that they need from our healthcare system. Um, and when you look at like physical health, we now have like robots that are operating on people and in mental health, they're like, haven't 
been a lot of advances. Like we're, I think I read that Spravato is the first major drug for depression that the FDA had approved new drug since Prozac. So like a 30 year gap. Um, so we're just desperately in need of innovation in the mental health care space. And I'd, I'd seen the research around psychedelics broadly, like the psilocybin studies done at you know, Hopkins and Imperial College, um, and also saw the research on ketamine that is just like remarkable. Um, the outcomes that you get relative to treatments that we have today, even for people who are resistant to current therapies. Um, so it was just seemed like such an incredible option to bring something that so many people need mm -hmm. um, to the forefront. So you were drawn to it. Um, so we are going to chat about your study titled At Home Sublingual Ketamine. Telehealth is a safe and effective treatment for moderate to severe anxiety and depression. But first, let's talk about the basics for people who may not know. Um, can you start off by telling us what, why ketamine? Like why use ketamine for depression and anxiety? Yeah, uh, great question. So yeah, I'll share a little bit about ketamine and then more about the mind bloom model and then we can go wherever you'd like from there. So ketamine is um, available today, unlike other psychedelics like MDMA and psilocybin, which show incredible outcomes, but are still in um, clinical trials. And so MDMA is probably a year away from FDA approval, psilocybin, you know, maybe, maybe two. Um, but ketamine is a drug that is on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. It's a anesthetic that was FDA approved in 1970 and is used safely in emergency rooms across the country every day. Um, and so and in around 2000, Yale discovered that it had these amazing properties for treating mental uh, psychiatric conditions. And over the last 20 years, there's been over a hundred clinical studies um, studying ketamine for psychiatric disorders and really consistently showing outcomes that far exceed antidepressants and talk therapy. So it's something that we can use today. Um, I think it's kind of a bit symptomatic of US healthcare that something that shows this much promise is still so largely inaccessible to so many people who really need it. You know, half of half of the people in the US will have a psychiatric illness in their lifetime, over half won't seek treatment, either because of, you know, access barriers, um, geography cost. Mm -hmm. So ketamine is something that clinicians can prescribe legally off label today. Um, and so that that's why that's why Mindbloom uses ketamine. Okay. And we hear about the dissociative effect a lot when when people talk about ketamine. Um, can you just tell our, a basic overview for people who may not know what that is and how that relates yeah. to it? Yeah. Yeah. So ketamine when used in sub anesthetic doses. So when it's used to treat psychiatric conditions, it's used, you know, one tenth, one twentieth, the dose that you would get for, um, anesthesia in a hospital. And so it produces dissociative effects, which are somewhat similar to psychedelic effects. Like you might kind of feel like out of body, um, you know, so you'll have like, you know, kind of changes in perception. And so when people go, when our clients go through treatment with mind bloom, they're wearing headphones and an eye mask, and it's really like an internal experience. So a lot of what's happening is, is perceptual, like what, what you're perceiving during this like 45 minute dissociative experience and clinical studies have shown that dissociation is actually a strong mediator of therapeutic benefit. So it's not just that the dissociation is a side effect of ketamine, but it's actually core to the therapeutic experience, um, much like, you know, much like we assume is the case with other psychedelics like psilocybin and MDMA. All right. Um, that was a, a great overview. I actually didn't know it was on the World Health Organization Essential Medicine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a super safe anesthetic because it doesn't depress respiration and heart rate. So you can use oh. it like on the battlefield or developing countries where you don't have access to electricity. So ketamine gets this reputation of being this um, like dangerous club drug of abuse yes, yes. when really it's incredibly safe, has been proven to be safe in much, much higher doses than you use for psychiatry um, and produces at the levels you're using for, um, for ketamine assisted therapy, like a much more like gentle dissociative experience than like the intense, you know, psychedelic experience that a lot of people think of. 
Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just thinking that you, you, uh, the connotations or how people, the stereotype, I guess, for ketamine. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the study you guys did. Was it published? I think I read it was going to be published in October. Or... Um, yeah. So it's it was actually published um, it's in the October edition of the Journal of Affective Disorders, but nice. was released online midsummer. So we've okay. been officially published for a couple months now. Okay. Uh, before we dive into the study, could I give a little a little bit of a intro on on Mindbloom? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so so Mindbloom, as as I mentioned, provides at home ketamine therapy for anxiety and depression. And we combined clinical services, uh, expert guide support, medication, and then uh, complete therapeutic programs delivered through an app. And so that's all delivered through telemedicine. Um, and so far we've, we've seen outcomes that far exceed those of traditional therapies at a small fraction of the cost of in-person treatment. So we're able to dramatically increase access because we can literally treat you in your home, also at a cost that's that's far lower. So that's our mission is to transform lives, to transform the world and increasing yeah. access is absolutely core to that. Yeah. So to date, we've facilitated over 100,000 treatment sessions for patients across 32 states. Um, so we're really able to reach a lot, a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to access this treatment. And I think too, uh, you know, with this population of people who have depression or anxiety, um, they may not want to go anywhere or have that motivation to, to, to go out for in-person therapy. So I think it's a very, it's unique in that way. Um, because you can just, yeah. kind of, you know, Hey, you can try this at home. You, you cause when you're depressed and I've, I've suffered from depression, you don't really want to do anything, you know? So like mm -hmm. something like, Oh, well, you don't, you don't have to do that much effort. You can do this at home. It's kind of really appealing. Yeah. And like white coat syndrome is real. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, get more anxious when yeah. they are interacting with a healthcare professional, because yeah. that's typically means something's wrong. Um, in-person treatments also require, like if, if in-person ketamine treatments require like a chaperone, like somebody to drive you there and back, cause you can't drive a vehicle the same uh, day after you've had treatment. Yeah. Um, have to, you have to spend a couple hours in the clinic. Yeah. Um, a lot of these kind of more like medicine as opposed to yeah. like complete therapeutic program oriented, um, treatment centers, you know, it's just kind of, it's more of a, med it's a sterile medical model. There's. Yeah infusions have like a needle, which a lot of people don't like. Mm -hmm. We use sublingual tablets. So it's just a lot of aspects of the program make it much more approachable and pleasant for our person, clients. Person friendly. Um, yes. Okay. So the study, so it was a prospective study. So you followed people over a period of time and it was an open label study. So people knew and the researchers, you guys knew, um, well, nobody was blind to the intervention. Everybody knew. That's right. Right. Okay. Um, so I like to focus on the methods section of a study because it kind of tells us, it, to me, it's almost more important than the results because it's like, hey, this is how it was set up. It's going to drive cool. the results in some way. So yeah, could you talk about that? Um, who was in the study? Um, who, wa who wasn't in the study and, and why you excluded certain people maybe? Yeah, so this, um, so what we did is we turned over all, all of our patient data to our authors, uh, the study authors. And so this study followed um, followed 1,247 Mindbloom clients over who we treated from January to November of 2021. And so the selection criteria for patients was the same as it is for Mindbloom treatment. And we list like exclusion criteria on our site. So essentially it's, you know, if you're, if you're a healthy adult with anxiety or depression, you're, you're likely eligible, but there are certain things like, um, uncontrolled high blood pressure, um, you know, like, like current severe substance use disorder. So there's, there's certain things that the clinician would rule out, um, for treatment, either for ketamine generally or ketamine therapy at home specifically. Um, that's, that's of course, another consideration that our clinicians are making. But so anyone who had, who was a mind bloom client and also completed at least two of the uh, symptom assessments that we include in our programs. So it was at baseline and then after two sessions and then after four sessions. 
And so we use the PHQ-9 to measure depression symptoms and the GAD-7 to measure anxiety symptoms. And so we were able to track the progress of our clients um, using those scales, which are commonly used for anxiety and depression. Right, right, right. I'm, I'm familiar with those. Um, so yeah, the GAD-7 for anxiety and PH-9 for depression um, used all the time. So uh, you talked a little bit about the different things that MindBloom brings um, that are unique. Um, so like, I guess like in plain language, could you just go over the, the intervention, like how basically step one, step yeah. two, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so step one is a patient would sign up and meet with their mind bloom clinician to determine if they're a fit for treatment. And so if the patient and the clinician determine that the person is a fit for treatment, then we mail us a single dose of ketamine to their home along with a, a bloom box, we call it, which is like a kit for safe at-home treatment that has like a journal and eye mask, a blood pressure cuff. So everything you need to do ketamine safely at home. Um, and then the client schedules their first session with a mind bloom guide. And so this is somebody who's a certified life coach and then is trained at mind bloom on how to support a patient throughout their ketamine therapy treatment. And so they're on video with the patient before and after their session, helping them kind of like cultivate the right mindset and physical setting for treatment. We also require all of our um, patients to have a friend or family member who's present. So the guide will just give them tips on like how to support the person during their at-home treatment. Um, and then the patient would take the medication with, you know, that we, we provide music for the session through our app. And so it's really, you know, kind of a gentle introductory session um, the last about 45 minutes, and then the patient would journal and then get back on video with their mind bloom guide who will kind of debrief the session and give them tips for integration moving forward. And, and um, core to the experience is, so something that we, we didn't get into related to ketamine is like how, like how ketamine interacts with your brain to create this therapeutic benefit. And so like two, the, the two reasons that ketamine is so effective for treating anxiety and depression is one, that it's increasing levels of brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF, which, is, which increases neuroplasticity, so the ability of your brain to repair and create new neural connections, and then also decreases activity in the default mode network, which is responsible for ruminating negative thoughts. And so by both kind of stopping those like negative thought patterns and giving your brain the ability while it's in this really fertile state to create new, more positive connections, you're able to kind of overcome some of those, you know, negative ruminations about the past related to depression or ruminations about the future related to anxiety and really like address those symptoms and create, you know, a, a, a mind state that's much more like ready to grow and improve. And so that's why taking ketamine, it's just on its own as just a purely pharmacological intervention is valuable. But when you pair that with things like, you know, therapeutic programming, the guide, um, you know, it's, we don't use therapists in our program, but commonly psychotherapists are involved in ketamine therapy treatment. And so it's how you take this really fertile brain state and create lasting change. Interesting. I wanted to um, ask you about the, uh, is that effect, uh, is, it's immediate, is, and is there any idea how long it lasts, or how do you have to keep up with the treatments? Because I, I actually don't know. Yeah, so the effects of the, the again, there, there's been a, a bunch of clinical studies of ketamine therapy, both single and series of treatments, and so the studies show after a single dose, and we see, and we see this like anecdotally with patients as well, after a single dose, you might get days or weeks of symptom relief. And with a series of treatments, you can get weeks to months. And so our initial program is six weekly treatments. And then our clinicians will work with our patients to extend the duration between treatments. So over time, you're transitioning to like every other week or once a month. Um, so you're, so it's not something that you take every day. It's something that, you know, is, is part of a like, you know, maintenance or yeah. as needed um, yeah. like, depending on the, the person. Um, and I'm going to ask you more about the route that you chose the sublingual route down and maybe like 
telling people to spit or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to, get to that <laughs> a little later. Um, but let, let's talk about, if you're ready to talk about the results, um, you just met, you mentioned the key outcomes, the depression scale and the anxiety scale. Um, so, and I know there was three groups that you identified in the study, um, improvement versus chronic versus delayed improvement, which was interesting. Um, but what, what did you guys see in terms of outcomes for depression and anxiety? Yeah, so we saw that after four weeks of treatment, 89% of our of the patient population saw significant improvement. Um, there was 63% saw a 50% or greater reduction in symptoms, which is like if, if you're used to traditional mental health treatments, like meta-analyses of psychotherapy show like 40% 40 per, uh, 40 response rates after like two months, antidepressants, like maybe 47%. And so we're at 63% after one month. So they're seeing dramatically larger improvements in a shorter period of time. Uh, we saw 30% of clients experience total remission of symptoms. So like no, no diagnosable anxiety or depression. Um, another really, uh, like really exciting finding was that there's a lot of data showing ketamine's impact on suicidal ideation. And we saw that um, of, our, of the patients who reported suicidal ideation at baseline, 62% no longer reported suicidal ideation after four sessions. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah we also saw like less than 1% deteriorated, which is a number like 10x lower than you see in other studies. Yeah. Um, and then the, I think by now, I think a lot of people have like psychiatry broadly has accepted the outcomes of ketamine. And so the bigger question is like, how do we use this safely? And so that was like an equally exciting findings of our studies were related to safety. We had a 0.3% dropout rate due to side effects or adverse events. So like four out of the entire patient population discontinued treatment because of adverse events of side effects are so extremely low um, and less than 5% reported side effects relative to an antidepressant where like 38% yeah. of people report side effects. So this is like one eighth the incidence of side effects of antidepressants. Um, I'm gonna get to side effects in a, in a, in a minute and you're, because you're right, most people are um, concerned about that. And some people even stop taking their medication because of the side effects, which is another mm -hmm. issue. Um, in the, from what I read in the study, if you had a um, higher baseline on uh, higher baseline score of depression and anxiety, um, you didn't, you did well, but you didn't do as well as if you had um, a lower score. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't think so. When we looked at more severe groups, we, we actually saw greater increases, which is like in line with what you see in, in other studies of more severe populations. Um, we, we did look at, so our population only includes people who hit uh, a certain level of like so moderate or higher severity on the PHQ nine or GAD seven. Okay. So we didn't we didn't look at we didn't include patients who had like mild symptoms oh, in the okay. study. Okay. Um, but we also we didn't look at like what the symptom reduction would have been for that group. But presumably, I got you. Like lower. Okay. Um, did any one group experience more dissociative effects than the other? Uh, what do you mean by group? Um, so like uh, the improvement group versus the, the chronic. Ah, got it. Yeah, versus the delayed improvement. Yeah, so, so this was a really interesting finding of the study. Um, there's, there, it seems from, from other studies of ketamine therapy that dissociation is a strong mediator of clinical benefit, but there's been like some mixed outcomes in across studies. And ours was similarly interesting in that those who, um, those who experienced greater dissociation after four sessions were more likely to be in the chronic group. So it's like, it's a very nuanced kind of measure based on the population. We also used kind of a custom dissociation scale that we found didn't have much sensitivity um, 
So it was, so it's kind of interesting. Like, frankly, if we were to replicate this study, I'm not sure that that result would be repeated. I mean, kind of conflicts with some other findings of dissociation related to sure. ketamine therapy and outcomes, but that's what it was in the data. And so our, um, our study authors wanted to report it. And the chronic group was, how did you guys define the chronic group? I forget. Uh, so this is um, way outside of my statistical expertise, but our authors <laughs> used, Simple, they used okay. a, a machine, <laughs> I'll do my best to echo them, <laughs> used a machine learning algorithm to, uh, to find whether patient populations fell into different groups. And so the idea here is that unlike if you just look at the data in aggregate, you might have different groups of patients that respond in different ways, but you're still now saying like, you know, the average shows that patients improve by, you know, 53%, but then how does that vary across different groups? And so when you're able to break out these different groups, it's more representative of what you would see in clinical practice. So essentially when we took all our patient data and threw it into this like unbiased machine learning algorithm, it spit out three different, um, like groups of patients, which was improvement. So people who improved after two sessions and continued to improve through session four. Um, and I think that was around 80% of our patient population, which is like remarkable. Another was delayed improvement. So people who maybe improved a little or stayed mostly flat and then improved from session two to four, and that was about 10%. And then we saw a chronic group. So people who actually on average still improved, but not a statistically significant amount. So something that you still could potentially attribute to just normal regression to the mean. And so that was 10% as well. And so that's how we get to that 89% overall improvement number, uh, okay, okay. which is also, yeah, which is also um, like a very clinically interesting finding because if you're a clinician who's treated someone for two weeks with ketamine and see that they haven't improved, what this, what these two groups would show is it's equally likely that they end up in the delayed improvement or the chronic group. So there's still, so there's still like justification to, you know, continue treatment and see if, if they could still get benefit. Sure. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. So that, thanks for clearing that up for me. Cause I was, <laughs> I was yeah, it's very, yeah. it's very confusing. I've had to sit in like hours of study <laughs> author meetings in order to <laughs> like be on my sort of way to understanding it. Um, so you started to talk about side effects before, and obviously that's mm -hmm. a really important issue. Um, we, we were talking before the podcast about, you know, side effects from conventionally prescribed medications for depression and anxiety. Um, lots of discussion around that on social media, even right now. Mm -hmm. um, so what did you find, maybe can you dive in a little more specifically to, in terms of adverse events and side effects? Um, Maybe and then like what were um, the main side effects that you that you saw? Yeah, so I think it's important to separate these out into like what's what you're experiencing during the session, and so something the dissociation that's experienced during the session is we're not including as a side effect. Like we consider that an important part of the treatment, and so a side effect is something that they've reported as you know persisting, um, you know, a, a week a week after treatment. And the side effects are typically mild, things like they're all, again, it's 5% total. So none of these um, exceeded 1% of patients, but things like you know, increased blood pressure, headaches, um, pain urinating. And then with the adverse events, there were, we, and we report these in the paper as well. So for anyone curious, go check out the paper. You can see exactly what they are. Um, and for adverse events, we had um, like someone who uh, saw a doctor about like urinary problems, like somebody who was uh, like went to the hospital and admitted themselves because of worsening symptoms um, and, and a, couple, a couple others you can read in the paper, but these were a, like a very small number um, for like, you know, for, for any your pharmaceutical. Rate, your dropout rate was pretty low. Yeah, it was 0.3%. Is... So it was four, four patients out of 1,247 dropped wow. out due to adverse events or side effects. Which it, it, yeah. It's just like re remarkably low, it especially is. when you consider like looking at- For this type of study this... and this patient population, it's definitely very low. 
Yeah. And so again, that's this stigma that ketamine is this unsafe, you know, intense drug. When, if you look at the side effect profile relative to something that, you know, so many people think of as innocuous, like an antidepressant, they're, they're less in both number and severity. Like the, like, again, 38% of people will experience a negative side effect from an antidepressant. And these can be things like weight gain, insomnia, like loss of sex drive, like all of these things that are really negatively impactful to your day-to-day -day life with a medication that you're taking every day and takes months to start to work. Oh, well, that's right. There's a, there's a lag period. Um, yeah. And then the, with, uh, the withdrawal too, just if you want to stop taking them, um, that has become an area of, um, lots of people are very concerned about that as well. Or it, people used to not talk about that. When, um, you know, when you took a SSRI for depression and there was really no understanding of, uh, you know, well, if you want to get off the medication, there's a withdrawal period. And then all of a sudden they're like, wow, it could last longer than two weeks and, and impact a lot more people. So, um, yeah. And, and it was the anecdotes. I mean, people are like, oh, it's anecdotal evidence, but really it was the anecdotes that got people interested and, you know, people, people posting online looking for support groups. And then people were like, oh yeah, there, there is this effect. Let's look at it closer. Um, let's mm -hmm. just not, let's just not tell these people to sh go, go away and shut up basically. Um, so yeah. 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 yeah we, we see uh, a, a lot of patients too, who come to us really hoping to titrate off their antidepressants. And so that's something that you know, considering our model, um, like we wouldn't like walk someone through because it's something that you need such like, you know, hands-on care as you're titrating off. Yeah, but you like you yeah. said, like a really serious medication like this, but um, our clinicians have worked with uh, patients, external providers to kind of help them slowly wean off in conjunction with their ketamine therapy. Um, so yeah, so yeah we, we see, we see all the time people who no longer want to be on antidepressants, which I say, I also have, like I mentioned, you know, um, like addiction and depression have have hit my family. And, and my my mom is someone who does really well on antidepressants. So you certainly see people who get a ton, you know, who get a ton of benefit and they get their life back because of these medicines. Um yeah, yeah. but yeah, for so many people that they can't or you know want to try something different. That's true. It's, it's working. It's working. That's great. yeah. Um I have, I, I always have that conversation with a friend who also takes antidepressants. He's like, oh, these work for me. They're great. And I'm like, that's great. Like that works for you. Yeah. Um, um, so it's always good to, when people find something that works for them, I, I totally agree. Um, I wanted to ask you about memory. I've read different things about memory. I didn't know if that came up in your study at all, whether people journaled about it or commented on it. Was it a side effect you were looking at? Uh, do you mean like memory loss? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Like memory loss or impacts on the memory. I think we had a hand, like a handful of people report memory like memory loss is a side effect. Um, not nothing that our clinicians raised as like uh, admit someone to the hospital, but just you know like mem like mental fogginess and memory issues. But it was it was a very small percentage, even of our um, even of our side effect group. Okay, and could you um, maybe how do people describe? or even, maybe not even in the study, but in, you know, the different people that you've worked with in Mindbloom, um, how do people describe the dissociative effect? Do they describe it in a positive way for the most part? Yeah, a vast, a vast majority describe it as a positive experience. Um, and it's like when you're working with your clinician, you know, kind of starting with this like, gentle introductory dose and then finding a dose that's getting you to like the right level of dissociation. Um, typically what people report from ketamine is feelings of like increased empathy, like increased happiness, kind of reduced mental chatter, um, kind of helps with this like perspective shift and like kind of opens you up, which is why it can be really valuable when paired with, you know, like a, a coach or a guide or, or therapy. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's predominantly people describe like positive, valuable, um, like perspective changing shifts. And of course there's some like feeling like you're floating, um, like a little bit of like disconnection from space, space and time at like higher dissociative doses. Um, but it's typically like not, not in that initial session that you're getting to 
like a more disconnected level of dissociation. Okay, so you, uh, you might start at a smaller dose and then up the doses as the treatments. Is that yeah? And, okay. Yeah, and this is like our clinicians at, with you know uh, lots of pre mind bloom experience and then three plus years of experience treating, um, yeah, you know, facilitating hundreds of thousands of or over a hundred thousand sessions of mind bloom. They've gotten very good at identifying like how to gauge whether somebody had like a level of dissociation in their experience that is likely to produce like strong clinical benefit and then titrating the medication accordingly. Um, so I wanted to ask you about this sentence in the paper, um, in which you touched on before a little bit. Uh, it says there were strong and consistent evidence that experiencing greater dissociation at the end of the treatment decreased the likelihood of symptom improvement for both depression and anxiety. Uh, do you have any theories on why that might be the case or any of the clinicians? Yeah, this is this like funky dissociation finding that popped up in our data that um, that doesn't mirror what clinicians experience anecdotally. But so in the study population, those who reported higher dissociation later in the program were more likely to be in that chronic group. Um, hypotheses might be that um, if somebody wasn't getting to a level of dissociation early, and didn't get to an, like that level of dissociation later, then maybe they were less likely to experience improvement at that time. It could be that there are some other confounding factors, like potentially somebody with a history of trauma might, and, and this is hypothetical, might experience like lower levels of dissociation and also see lower benefit from ketamine. Um, and like we certainly see, see great benefits from from people who come to us who have experienced trauma, but so it could be some confounding other variable that's murky in the data here. Um, there was like not to a level of statistical significance, but there was evidence in the data that like dissociation after session two produced uh, greater clinical benefits. Like outside of the study, when we look at our own internal data, we do see a positive correlation between dissociation and clinical benefit. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of a, it's yeah, it's it's kind of a funky funky finding, but, but no, it was there, so we reported it. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe you'll find it again. Maybe you won't. Um, when you mentioned uh, people who have experienced trauma, I was thinking. I know that um, when I first heard about ketamine, I'm I'm connected with a lot of veteran groups, and there's oh cool yeah, there's a lot of interest um, there, uh, and I was I was curious. Do do you guys get a lot of um, do you work with a lot of veterans or is there interest there? Yeah, we do. We have a good number of clinicians who are veterans too, um, which is really cool. So we can pair like veterans with, you know, if we have a clinician who's a former veteran in their state, um, you know, somebody who's, you know, who's, who's potentially like has a lot of shared experience. Um, but yeah, we, we treat a lot of, um, PTSD if it's comorbid with anxiety or depression, that's not an indication that we, um, that we treat independently, but of course, like oh, most, okay. most people with PTSD will have anxiety, you sure. know, some anxiety or depression. So that, that is something we've seen sure. like great, great results from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so can we talk about the benefits of sublingual at home ketamine compared to IV ketamine, which is what you were doing in the clinic before COVID? Uh, so we've actually we were sublingual ketamine from day one oh, okay. um, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, and I will, tr I will try to get into only the ones that I think your, your audience might find okay. interesting <laughs> and not the boring ones. That's okay. um, but, but so like, what? Well, so for, kind of from day one, uh, we had a clinic in Manhattan pre COVID, but we would transition our patients. Like once we observed that they had a safe and positive experience in the clinic, we would transition them to at-home treatment. So it was this combination model. And we had like blood pressure medication and anxiety medication on hand in the clinic, and we never used a single pill. So by, by the time COVID hit, we were very comfortable with the safety of this model, had treated, you know, had facilitated hundreds of sessions for our clients at home. So we were very comfortable transitioning to a fully telehealth model. Um, and so the benefits of, uh, 
we kind of did this for a couple of reasons. One was patient experience. Like most people would much prefer yeah. like a tablet that you oh. put under your tongue than, um, yeah, going in person to probably a somewhat sterile clinic to have a needle put in your arm and then be monitored by, you know, a nurse for an hour while you're getting your ketamine infusion. Um, so patient experience is one. Um, cost is two. Like if you're going to an in-person clinic where you have costs of the space, costs of staff, like the equipment, it's far more expensive than ketamine, which is a generic medication. If you're using it in a sublingual tablet, um, and I guess there's a third too, it's, it's access, which is we can reach you anywhere in the country. And we reported that, um, you know, there's some of our, uh, the patients in our study were in a rural population that almost certainly wouldn't have access to IV ketamine. Right, right, right. Sure, sure. That's, and that's always a tough population to reach. Mm -hmm. um, and the sublingual, and this is where I want, I want to talk a little bit about, um, cause you were telling your patients to, do you call them patients, by the way? I'm not sure if you do or not, but uh, yeah, we, we call them, we say, we say clients, but I've been saying patients for your, okay. Okay. I assume you have a more clinical audience. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. So, <laughs> um, some people are particular about that. I just wanted to check, but that you tell them to not swallow, this is going to sound terrible, but not swallow, but to spit because. Yeah. You, okay. Can you talk a little bit why? You yeah. Yeah. For, for sure. Um, so when, so what we, so our protocol is that our patients put the sublingual tablet under their tongue for seven minutes and then spit out the saliva. And that's when you, um, when you ingest ketamine orally, ketamine turns, um, metabolizes to norketamine, which has a longer half-life and seems to produce unwanted side effects like grogginess and nausea. Um, and so what we're trying to do is because, and because the dissociative experience is so important, what we're trying to do is to create that dissociative spike early on through that sublingual tablet, but then kind of like get rid of the, um, like get rid of the excess that you don't want to convert right. to norketamine. Right. And so what that helps to do is to create like a kind of like more bang for your buck, a greater level of dissociation rel relative to the um, amount of ketamine that you're absorbing and the amount of time that you need to spend kind of like in a, you know, altered state from, from the ketamine. So like uh, you, many, many practices will have their patients hold sublingual and swallow. And so that's, you know, a method that many use, but creates kind of like a longer recovery as opposed to the, the spit method. So um, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a little yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely like sounds, sounds odd, but um, it's it's worked really well. And our study shows, you know, that this is like proven to be really effective. Over There's the... a method behind it. I, how long do these dissociative effects last after one treatment? Do you know? Yeah, yeah. So the I'm I'm actually a mind bloom patient myself. Um, oh, cool. I, okay. Yeah, I've struggled with anxiety, and so mind bloom has has been really helpful for me. Um, so, so I've been a, a mind bloom patient for, for three years now and the dissociative. So essentially like you put the tablet under your tongue, it takes about 10 minutes to start to feel the effects. And then they come on like pretty quickly. And then you have this dissociative experience for usually like 30 to 45 minutes for some people it might be an hour and then, a, and then a pretty quick return to baseline. So that's why we have our patients. So the, um, like they're listening to music for an hour. And then after an hour, they're taking off their headphones and starting to journal um, for 30 minutes before they meet with their guide after their first session. And so that, that so you're usually able to journal um, after your session and then able to like carry on a conversation with, you know, your coach 30 minutes after that. Um, so you might still be like a little groggy or foggy, um, but you're, you know, like more or less returning to baseline. So we, we certainly ask our clients to commit to not operating a motor vehicle until they've had a full night of rest, um, but, but are, are usually close to baseline a couple hours after administration. 
That's, that's so interesting. And then the journaling, you guys do that anyways. That's not just part of the study. That's like standard part of yep. your process. Okay. Yeah. And so the, when you're in this dissociative state, it's almost like a dream in that there's all of this content that comes up. And if you don't write it down right after, like it's very fleeting. And so journaling helps not only to start to um, kind of like synthesize and make sense of what you might have seen or felt during the session, but also make sure that you're not going to forget like all of these like insights or thoughts that you have and want to hold on to during your session. It's also a really cool way. Like I wasn't a journaler before Mind Bloom, um, and it's a really cool way to look back and say like, "Whoa, I was really in a different place," you know, two three months ago. And I kind of assumed that not much had changed until I went and looked at the things that were bothering me or I was struggling with back then. And so it's really, it's a really cool like guidepost to see, you know, to kind of calibrate your change over time. Oh, that's so cool. And you, um, you, you use this and you're, you see the benefits in your day-to-day -day life. It seems you're like, I, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, I kind of, when you're describing it, I kind of want to try it. Um, I mean, I get, I get anxiety <laughs> that's, about specific that's things. What like, we're here I for. get flight anxiety. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I should take <laughs> It's It's really cool. So I, the, um, like what it helps to do is kind of take an objective view. And this, a lot of our clients, you know, will mention this, and um, I very much feel this as well, is if something is like bothering you, or you have an insecurity or something that you kind of have like buried that you don't really want to maybe even admit to yourself or bring up. It's when you're in this like low ego state with your default mode network kind of like turned down, you can really look at something like more objectively and kind of like detach from emotion. And so it's a really cool way to say like, why, why does that bother me? Like, why am I worried about this? Like, this is so normal or this, does not matter. Like my relationships matter. Like my impact on the world that I'm making through like the work that I'm doing really matters. But like this deadline or like stress that I'm bothering my boss, uh, who's probably going to listen to this podcast, but that's okay. Um, or, or You're like, doing great, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or like other insecurities. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can just kind of almost like you're giving advice to a friend, which is really helpful. Cause then you had that thought that it's, it's not like when you're kind of, you know, if you've had a little bit too much to drink the next day, you're like, those were thoughts that were not me. That was altered me. But with ketamine, you're like, oh, that's actually, that's true me. This is like my normal waking consciousness is like skewed by these insecurities or like anxieties I've developed. And so you can remember that feeling. And then that's like the whole point of integration is then you're integrating that feeling into like your day-to-day -day life so that you can take an experience and turn it into lasting change. That's so interesting. Um, I just had a conversation with someone about how anxiety kind of takes away uh, your ability to be objective. And, and all of a sudden this voice, uh, your like the insecurities have this loud voice in your head or your fears are taking over your brain. And um, it's, and you don't even, sometimes you don't even realize it. Like a lot of times you don't, yeah. you just don't know what's happening. Yeah. So that's so, that's so, um, I'm, I'm very curious about that for sure. I'm, I'm sure I'd probably benefit from something like this. Um, uh, even though I, 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 I haven't, I totally have anxiety about certain things. Um, so it'd be, be interesting. I mean, I don't necessarily have a diagnosis, but it'd be interesting to. <laughs> to yeah. It's, I mean, I think most of us are in the camp of most people who work in the psychedelic space, I shouldn't say most, I've spoken with many people in the psychedelic space who feel very strongly that these medicines could be really powerful, even for people who don't have a diagnosis, because they're so powerful for um, just personal growth and, you know, evolution and perspective changing and like thinking critically about your own consciousness. Um, but for now, we're confined to treating people who, you, you know, have a have a yeah. DSM diagnosis. Yeah. But I think there's also kind of a misconception that like if you have a diagnosis of anxiety or depression, you're like it's crippling and like you can't function. When in reality, you know, it's much more, it's not like bipolar. It's you, you know, it's it's graduated. And so you could have like mild anxiety or depression and still get a lot from these from these treatments. Um 
you know, it's, it's not just reserved for those who are, you know, desperate and have been let down by other forms of treatment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, you can always definitely um, function for sure. I was curious, um, I, didn't, I didn't send this, this question, but I was curious, do you guys, you must deal with having to educate when people hear ketamine, right? Like they must have this gut reaction, kind of like, oh, that's a bad drug. Like that's a street drug or something. Um, I don't know if you still have, I mean, it's changing. People are changing. Yeah. But do you come across that? Um, yeah, for sure pretty regular. That's, <laughs> you have to yeah, deal with yeah, that quite for, a bit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, that it is, it's amazing how much things have changed over the past three years. Um, in relation to psychedelics more broadly, it's almost surprising that it seems like the perception of psychedelics is shifting, but people still kind of like think of ketamine differently, even though it's this medicine that has like, it's so much, it's been studied so much more often because it's available to like it's legal and, F and FDA approved. Um, so it's something that like researchers can get their hands on, which is why there's been like a hundred plus clinical studies over the past 20 years. Um, but yeah, there's still this, this perception. And so um, even though it's it just uh, being, being an incredibly biased source here, obviously it's like just so much more valuable. Like so you get such better outcomes with such lower level of side effects than traditional treatments, yet ketamine is a teeny fraction of the mental health market. And so there's just so much room to help so many more people by both changing the stigma, educating them about benefits, educating providers, because so many people, or I think something like 70% of people won't try something unless it's referred, if, unless they're referred by, like won't try a treatment unless they're referred by their provider. Um, so just so important to shift perception so that we can bring this, this treatment to so many people who really, really yeah. need it. Yeah. I, and the way to do, I mean, to get, to get clinicians, you know, is, is to keep doing the research and, and keep producing yeah. yeah positive results. And then, um, cause you do have to be careful. They have to be careful. Like they're, you know, the license. Oh, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. It's your, it's your livelihood. Yeah, absolutely. So what is next for mind bloom? That's my, my final question here. Do you guys have other studies plans? Um, you're, are you growing, expanding? Yeah, we're so, I mean, we have this now wealth of data on using ketamine um, for, for treatment. So our study was the largest ever study of ketamine therapy or psychedelic medicine. Um, and we've, we've only collected more data since. So we're really excited to, look at like durability of treatment to look at um treatment like kind of focusing on and on like other indications like ptsd um like substance use disorders and then we're a like we're using ketamine now because it's available but are really excited for the future of psychedelic medicine so once mdma and psilocybin are approved um we certainly uh, plan to incorporate them into our clinical practice and be able to, you, you know, guide people to the right medication that's right for them. Um, it, it's it's just so exciting to think that there's been so little movement for so long, and now we're like on the precipice of all of these new like next generation mental health treatments. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really exciting time to work in mental health. Yeah, no, and I like how you guys. I I worked in the digital health field for. A while it's um it's nice that you guys have like a guide to like an actual person yeah. i think that's very helpful to the whole model yeah and our guides spend like over four hours of time with each client either synchronously or asynchronously through their succession program so yeah again like you're in this really fertile brain state and so it's so valuable to have somebody who can you know make you feel really comfortable educate you walk you through the process because it's it's different from traditional medication where you know, like you take a pill and it acts upon you as opposed to like taking more agency in your treatment and, you know, preparing and having an intention and, you know, kind of reflecting and journaling to really be like an active participant in your healing and growth and also have somebody who's like a compassionate expert who's going to support you along the way. Fascinating. Um, thank you so much, Jack. This was really interesting. Uh, it's, it's such a cool area. Um, that's just, uh, probably going to explode in the next few years, even, um, I'm going to share the link 
to your paper. Uh, so if anybody wants to read it, they'll have that. If they want to check out Mind Bloom um, or any other Mind Bloom related stuff, what what's the best way? I don't know if you guys are yeah, on go, um, social head media. over to Mind Bloom. Yeah, head over to mindbloom.com or at my mind bloom on on social media. Um, I'll give you a link to to kind of a summary of our study that's a little bit more digestible and links out to our study. Perfect. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Well, this will stay in touch. I, I definitely want to um, hear about the other studies that you guys if you if you get results um, that, that I think it's great. Um, I'm also <laughs> I kind of want to try it now. <laughs> It sounds well, like, I, yeah. You, you now that you know the website, you know yeah. Now I up. have the website, I might sign up just to see. Um, but I, yeah, I think it sounds uh very that it can really help a lot of people in all seriousness. So that's why it's really interesting, um, to me. Um, sorry, there's a chime going off, but um, all right, well, thanks so much. Uh, take care, and I will follow up via email. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I had a blast. Oh, you too. Okay, bye. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining in and a big thank you to Jack for coming on and doing a great job breaking down that study for us. So, you know, I have included links to the study and Mind Bloom in the podcast description, as well as in my blog at bloomingwellness.com. You can reach me through my website or find me on social media. Um, I always appreciate the feedback and request. Speaking of feedback, one was that I should end each episode with a quote. I kind of like that. So I started doing it a few episodes ago. Um, so maybe this will become a tradition, I don't know. Um, that's how traditions start, right? Um, the quote may or may not be related to the topic. It could be completely random. Uh, usually they are completely random. So this quote is from a book I like called 100 Years of Solitude. Here it is. And both of them remained floating in an empty universe where the only everyday and eternal reality was love. Okay, that's it. Um, subscribe, stick around, and hopefully I'll see you guys here next time. Bye.